In Canada, one woman is killed in a violent act every other day. The spike in domestic violence that began during the pandemic is still on the rise. Numbers in Canada have leapt by 27% since 2019, and in Israel, the situation is just as critical, with 16 Israeli women already murdered this year. True to its mission, CHW is stepping up to support emergency services in Canada and Israel at this critical time. Help CHW empower victims of domestic violence by supporting the 27-hour SOS crowdfunding campaign. From August 22nd to 23rd, every dollar will be quadrupled when you donate online at chwsos.ca. This is Bonjour Chai, the Everybody Knows Edition. I'm Avi Feingold in Montreal, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltzbovi in Toronto. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, we talk about Haredi violence against women and against soldiers and whether something is rotten in the state of Israel. Plus, we get into Bradley Cooper's prosthetic choices. God knows it's big enough for both of us to get into, Phoebe. And of course, a fragrant bouquet of nachas to top it all off. So, Phoebe... How's it going? All right. How about you, Avi? What's new? <laughs> Doing all right. We're in the, uh, is it technically the dog days of summer? Are we uh, the puppy days? Is the it, coyote days. Is it back to school yet? Is it uh, thinking about back to school? So that's something I have been wondering because my older child does like a camp at her school's aftercare. And the camp runs almost all summer, but she's doing it just like in the lead up to school. So it feels like it's already kind of back to school. It's the same building. It's a lot of the same people, but it's not technically school. Yeah. And I keep misspeaking and being like, have a good day at school. I'm like, wait, but camp, but it's in the school. And it's all extremely confusing to me. Such is life. Um, we're still, yeah, we are shopping. We are doing stuff. We, we have enough school supplies. Like we, you've got to the point where you buy enough school supplies at some point where year in, year out, you're not buying that much more because mm. you have a backlog of like previous year's extra mm-hmm. purchases and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so we are there for this year. But uh, that, that'll be the next uh, highlight of your life is when you get a very, very detailed list of school supplies and you say to yourself, well, you know, I would have much been much happier had the teacher who saw this in the store bought 25 of them for everybody in the class and said, here, I'll just charge you whatever it is. Well, this sounds, oh boy. So I better get a lot of good work done in these years before my children are old enough to require this because it sounds like a full-time job in its own right. Absolutely. Anyways, (laughs) speaking of full-time jobs, um, you have a full-time job at the Globe and Mail. No, I don't. You have a part-time job. I I have a full-time job at the CJN. I was trying to make a a segue Um, into something. No, but I don't want to, I don't want to give mistaken (laughs) impressions of uh, where I'm spending my time. Um, I am full-time at the CJN. However, I also have a column in the Globe and Mail. Can you share us a bit about your column? Um, Because I had thoughts. So basically, um, so I was assigned this column, um, but I was very glad I was because it allowed me to uh, write about, to sort of set aside some time to more deeply look into and write about some things that I had been sort of um, paying attention to, but not closely enough, which is basically... um, the impact that the emboldened religious right, as per the headline, and that seems fair, um, has had on women in just sort of day-to-day life in Israel. So um, I should give in terms of my own background with respect to Israel. I'm not Israeli. I speak some Hebrew. I've been to Israel sometimes, but um, I don't obviously live in Israel. I live in Toronto. Um, but basically, there have been these news reports coming. Not fr- There was a big article in the New York Times, which kind of prompted this, but there was also um, an even more upsetting article in the Jerusalem Post about basically um, women in public spaces in Israel being sort of either told to leave those spaces, like don't get on a train car because like some ultra-Orthodox men feel that this should be an all-male train car. Um, or- There's a lot of people that wish that People told Jews not to get on the train car, but that's different. <laughs> a different, a different, <laughs> a different context. context. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, but then there was this story in the, and like some libraries having now different hours for public libraries for boys and girls um, in Israel. And also um, that story that I found sort of somehow the most upsetting was, this was in the Jerusalem Post about uh, some female IDF soldiers being basically harassed and bullied um, 
by some uh, ultra-Orthodox train passengers and called sort of like uh, called basically like dogs and shiksas which is so absurd for so many reasons and I just I mean ah uh, I, I don't I'm an I'm old school boring liberal you know liberal Zionist boring person like that old school person of that nature and I read this and I'm just furious uh, you know I'm furious I'm sorry I am not part of this sort of like new um and i so this is what i get into in my article though the argument of the article isn't gosh isn't it terrible that you know traditionalist people sometimes act in bigoted ways against women because like sure yes but what's what's new about that i mean there's the israeli political (laughs) what's new about that but then what i'm interested in is sort of like this bigger picture like does this mean that israel is now this outlier in the world and um where, you know, because people would always say for years, defenders of Israel, Israel's a liberal democracy. Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel's good because it's liberal. Who cares how you feel about Jews? You should support Israel because it's so liberal. You know, and that's like the whole so-called pink washing, you know, saying like you should support Israel because, you know, of gay rights and um, Tel Aviv's pride march and all of this. So I'm saying, is has this actually changed things if Israel is not quite so liberal as it once was in its sort of day-to-day life, like socially liberal. And my sort of theory is, no, it doesn't actually change things because globally there's been this upsurge of traditionalism and this sort of backlash to feminism. Um, Can you get an abortion in America? I don't mean you personally, Avi. I mean, people... (laughs) If I wanted (laughs) to. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it depends where, and it's it's not so easy anymore. Um, So basically, yeah, I think... I think that Israel taking a kind of social rightward turn, um, also like there was some survey in the U.S. of how socially conservative, I forget if it's young people or all people, and I think I cited this, are, and it's there's like this big upswing in social conservatism. So this actually, this is not a case of like me singling out Jews or Orthodox Jews specifically, ultra-Orthodox even more specifically for being particularly sort of over the top with traditionalism, but rather I think this is just kind of the vibe more broadly and is actually an example of Israel being kind of in keeping with the rest of the world. The global trends. Yeah. So uh, a few things. So first of all, um, I'm really glad that you um, wrote about this because I have been noticing this and many other people have been noticing this for quite a while. So this isn't actually a new phenomenon. No. This no. is something that has been going on for years already in uh, Israeli society. This is even before the current government. This is even, you know, many, many governments ago, although to say that in Israel, well, that's, if you go to that the, gives if us you only three years. Wall, if you go to the wall <laughs> and you're... Just the Western the, Wall. The Western Wall. Yeah, I don't mean like the wall in, in the room I'm sitting in. No. Um, if you go to the Western Wall and you're a woman and you're not, you know, modestly dressed enough by the determination of people there, they put something on you, right? Like this is... Well, I was going to say that, did you not notice that there was a story last week um, about women that were on a bus and were being forced, they were given cover-ups and forced to... Uh, there have been more stories. <laughs> so did I not notice? It's hard to say. I mean, I, I found a ton of stories. I didn't cite them all. But yeah, there, there's there been, it's been kind of constant. Yeah. Western Wall is a great example of that. And I, I want to get back to that example specifically. Um, but the the trend that you're saying there, right, and you're saying that it's, uh, is it a liberal democracy? But it is, and it isn't anymore. But that's where the world is going, right? The, 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 the words that I keep hearing or the idea that I keep hearing from people who are supportive of these uh, changes are basically saying, well, this is what the government wants. So this is democracy, right? You voted in a government that is saying that this is what should be happening. Then this is democratic. And, but it's not uh, this, liberal. And that's what the ta- this tablet article that I cited was yeah. saying is that it's, it's democracy, but not liberal. Um, and lots I think of, that lots it's, of people who are not. So the problem, though, in, is that I don't think history. that that's actually the case because with these coalition governments, it's not what the people have voted in. It's a small segment of a larger coalition that now gets to, you know, pull puppet strings and get to say, well, we are part of the majority. We now get our say religiously. Um, 
this is not right, and this is the greatest argument for a total separation of church and state within these within Israeli society. I think that it is a travesty to go and say that um, only certain types of religious opinions should get um, prioritized over other people's. Uh, religious positions. Um, I think that in private synagogues, you get to say whatever you want. You get to, you have a responsibility to be respectful, but if you don't want to be, that's your choice. It's your private religious space. Um, Israel is not a private religious space. It is a public religious space. And as a result, um, to go and say, well, there is only one type of religious um, action, and that is ultra-Orthodoxy, um, that is not just wrong, but it is false. It is it is patently false, um, even according to the ultra-Orthodox Haredi people that are making these types of, uh, you know, regulations. There are modern Orthodox people that have different approaches. They'll, they'll go and say, no, this is exactly what the Torah will tell you. And they, you know, they're taking a very narrow interpretation that uses a, you know, uh, 200 year old concept of what orthodoxy actually is, right? Involving Western European or, sorry, Eastern European ideas of Haredi Judaism, of what, you know, Judaism was as a response to reform, doesn't even take into consideration Sephardic Judaism, which has a long tradition of tradition, right? And not, has no way in which this is part of it, except for the fact that Sephardic Jews in Israel, many of them have become Haredi. Right, that was, was going to be my next know, question. Is in it, everything it seems but like name, right? Yes, the, what you call Shas yes. Sephardic Jews, right. right, are basically people who are very proud of their Sephardic roots, follow Sephardic customs and traditions, but essentially follow it in a Haredi, you know, manner, uh, for all intents and purposes, using an Eastern European yeshiva model for their for their living. Um <clears throat> And that's a broad generalization. So, like, I, I actually want to take the opposite, you know, view here for just for a second, because I have I have a certain amount of sympathy for people that are religious, right, who, who want to live their lives well, in a religious, religious manner. I am, exactly, but I'm also... I would like to think fairly tolerant of many, many other uh, forms of religion and to say that, you know, I, I live my life um, by the mantra of a book that I uh, read a long time ago. And uh, all we need to know is that the title um, is by it's a book by Brad Hirschfield. Um, and it's called You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right. Right. And it's about religious differences and tolerances. And this idea that like what I do for my religious practice is right for so me. So what is the case for telling a woman she can't get on a, a No, so train? I, I don't wanna I don't wanna make the case of that, but I wanna make the case of how do we um have um a level playing field where we go and we have room for people whose opinions we don't like, who have certain approaches, who are a significant minority. Right within Israeli society, how do we accommodate certain religious views while still allowing for a you know religious democracy to exist? And I, I'm not sure the answer to that, but there, I think that there has to be an answer. And to go and say that you don't belong and you don't exist, and because you are ultra orthodox, your positions on women and you know public life should, and the army, right, and any other forms of public life should be completely disregarded. I don't, I'm not necessarily sure that I believe in that. And okay, so I have so, to figure yes, out what yes. the better way sure. to approach this is. Okay, so I'm going to yeah. tell you something about a different <laughs> document, which I just read called Discover Canada. Okay. A PDF <laughs> that I just read, because it addresses this very issue. Um, because Canada, you could say, is a not so different country in a lot of ways, because as per Discover Canada, Christian founding, it has a religious theme to its democracy. It's not Jewish, it's Christian. Mm -hmm. It's more overt about that than the US, as I learned when reading Discover Canada. This is the document you have to study to prepare for your citizenship test. Um, so basically, there's a little passage in Discover Canada. There's a section called The Equality of Women and Men. And I'm quoting, okay, in Canada, men and women are equal under the law. Canada's openness and generosity do not extend to barbaric cultural practices that tolerate spousal abuse, quote, honor killings, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, or other gender-based violence. Those guilty of these crimes are severely punished under Canada's criminal laws. Okay, and now I'm going to read all 68 pages of this PDF. No, but basically, I thought that that said in a pretty succinct way with, and, and, and I don't mean by it said it in a succinct way, therefore it's an easy thing to solve individual cases because obviously it's extremely complicated. Um, 
But the fact of the matter is, like, you can say, yes, multiculturalism, yes, cultural and religious diversity, but draw a line at such things as harassing female IDF soldiers on the train. I draw the line 100%. I'm not trying to take that line. Okay. Right? I think that it's deplorable to call anybody a bad name, to, to cause any sort of violence to anybody. But, right. It's absolutely deplorable. But do what you I'm trying to figure out to tell somebody that she can't get on a train car she's trying no, to get No, so, so that's what that's I was trying to t- figure t- out. Yeah. Suppose we had um, a society in Israel where violence was completely abhorred, But there was a need to recognize this idea of separateness within a significant minority of the population. And um, the public buses ran every morning two buses for men and two buses for women only. And it was totally equal. And Where do non-binary people take the bus? Uh, Let's bracket that for a second, (laughs) right? But uh, because, yeah. Uh, I, I would really like to bracket that for a second. I'm not denying the existence and sure. the validity of it. Um, but there was no violence about it. There was nothing crazy. But they just said every day, if you are a Haredi male or a Haredi female and you want to ride in a separate you know, space, uh, we will be providing public buses that are purely for men or purely for women. They will be clearly indicated and nobody's going to get angry about it. We're going to do the same thing on public trains. We're not going to make it entirely there. Um, but we we are going to go and create spaces like that. Would that be considered acceptable? Like, I'm not even sure that I, I agree or disagree. Be, I'm trying well, to figure so I it think out. Acceptable is a separate question. I mean, I think Israel can become a theocracy and live with that and expect that Jews elsewhere in the world are not going to be, except for the most religious, are going to be like, okay, forget No, this Israel. isn't becoming a theocracy. We're saying that like oh, Israeli... Oh, I think so, to fund ha- single-sex buses. Haredi, Haredi... Th- but why, in, why should the state exchange, pay for that? In exchange, the state is paying for LGBTQ pride parades, and the Haredi people will have no co- like a- ability to complain about that and say the same thing. What I'm saying like is we're that doing I think, some like horse trading to be able to say but it, we pay I, for secular, I, we pay for Israelis, yeah. and if Israelis demand X, we're willing to provide X. I don't really. I, I think the problem in Israel at this point is this ongoing one of that there isn't really like a sort of allowance for, as you have talked about, I was going to say, can I finish the thought? Uh, Let me finish the yeah. sentence for different <laughs> types of religious expression, even. So if you want to go to Israel and get married in a conservative or reform wedding, you can't like, it's pretty, I'm with you. Yes. I'm so with what you. I'm I just say, trying what I was gonna to say is that I think, <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess my interest in Israel, my support for Israel. And I, I don't think I'm alone in this. It comes from this idea, the very like Herzlian, whatever idea of it is like, you know, a secular Jewish state that certainly has religious Jews in it, but that is not, you know, it's like a secular liberal democracy for Jews, the way that, you know, France is a secular liberal democracy for Catholics, nominal Catholics, whatever. You know what I mean? If 20% of the population wanted separate buses and they were said, we are not going to be violent about it. We really just feel like this is important for us. Um, we don't want to get angry about things. We, we really we want everybody. We're happy for the government to fund whatever else is going on. We just want this for us. Good for you. That in theory, I'm trying to solve the Middle East crisis here, right? That I'm just trying to like answer, like thinking at that level, right? So if that was um, happening, Diana, so here's right, a, that would I be just, enough. I mean, this gets to be like, right, I, for, I mean, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an Israeli. Israel government expert, but this to me seems like a case where local governments versus state governments would come into play and that you could, yeah. Sure. I actually, the example that you gave about libraries, I thought was a great and example of that, that, where abhorrent. they went and said, we're going to have separate hours repugnant. for boys and girls. But, <clears throat> well, would it be, is it better that that happened? Is it better that that happened than they that they chop off the heads of all the girls? Come? Sure, but I'm saying like, no, here's... no. I'm saying that I don't think that that yeah. <laughs> I think society should not be divided by gender. I don't think it matters because, like, so let me just just bear with me for a second. There is a lot of discussion these days: who is a woman? What is a woman? Who gets to be which gender? Who decides all of this? This seems a little bit like. <laughs> running screaming in the other direction like who's to say who's the woman and who's the man uh, for the purposes of getting on a bus you know? I, I i don't disagree i, I agree with you and that this is that this is a, a this is a problem that needs to be solved just as much but it sounds like we're willing to bend over backwards for 
anybody who has a question of gender identity, single sex. Sounds bathrooms, like in Israel, there's a bit of bending over backwards for, for the other for for, in the other direction. Exactly, Jews, and so yes. so the question becomes: Why are we willing to bend over backwards in a towards secularism? And yet, if Israel is filled with people that are not secular, we're not willing to bend over backwards for so many people. And the problem here lies in a hundred. Not 100 percent, but the vast majority of the problem lies here with the intractability of Haredi Jews and their absolute inability to to discuss this with anybody, to say that we are going to be willing to work with you. It's our way or the highway and that that's a huge problem. Right. Well, this or what you're talking about secularism. This, you're talking about secularism. I'm not even talking about secularism and neither are you necessarily because everybody who's not an ultra orthodox Jew isn't secular. You're not an ultra orthodox For sure. Jew. Are you secular? Yes, I am not secular. So there you but, go. So I mean, I but, guess that's why I feel like the bending over backwards I'm, to me, it seems like this is at the to the detriment not only of you know hyper liberal Jews in Tel Aviv, but of like you know basically several weeks ago. This one, several weeks ago, yeah. I was at Yorkdale in Toronto, and uh, apparently Yorkdale has switched over to all gender bathrooms um, in their mall, and I can see that there were many people that are otherwise very comfortable being in a Western liberal democ- democratic society that were very confused by this, that were uncomfortable, people that were of a specific gender and said, I don't want to be here, not because I don't want to be next to somebody that is trans, but because I'm a woman and I want to be in the bathroom with only other women. However, that and it's going to take a long time for that to happen. There was no violence going on, but you know that there was this notion that, like, hey, this is what we do in society. We're we're saying that gender is a lot more fluid, and it's it's confusing for a lot of people. But we are going to make this change on behalf of the people that care about this. Um, and I think that there needs to be a solution that needs to be made. And and I'm putting the Haredi you know, population to task for this because they're not willing to make these changes internally and in saying we need to work within a society as opposed to impose our belief on everybody else. And yet that's what they're doing and they're adding the violence to it. So I think that that's the problem. It's a hundred percent the problem, but I think that if people that are religious are a significant part of a population, there should be some sort of accommodation if they are being, you know, nice and responsible about it. That's well, all it doesn't that I'm sound like they for. are being nice and responsible. They are not. A hundred percent. On an individual exactly, basis, I keep saying, I'm sure yeah. some are. But what I was going to say about the bathrooms, first of all, I'm going to like digress because I noticed this at the AGO recently, the Art Gallery of Ontario. It was the first time I'd seen this in a public space, like a multi stall, yep. all gender. Yep. I don't think I'd seen this since college when this was in my dorm. And I remember being very much when I started college, like, yeah, that's great. All gender, you know, bathrooms. And then it wasn't actually um, for a variety of reasons. It was not great. Um, I guess I'm just going to this isn't really so much like an argument is just like where I stand on this, which is that I think like they're very like I think gender should not matter except where it does. And I, that's pretty much my like strong stance well, for, for these this, people. It does. Is, But what I was going to say, this is, I'm talking about where this person, I'm talking about myself, where I stand on this, which is that I think a public bathroom, you know, with multiple stalls is a case where maybe it does matter. And that doesn't, like you say, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with trans people. It's like, go to the one that that you should feel comfortable going to, you know, is different from like all gender where like literally 50, 50 chance we see a man or a woman coming out of the bathroom. Well, there's no 50, 50 there. You're the one that said it yourself. It is there. There is enough people in the. There's not, just enough, <laughs> just enough, but approximately it, 50, 50, even even in downtown Toronto. But what I'm saying is um, that bathrooms or like, you know, certain like sports or certain cases where it's going to matter. But what I'm saying is that in the vast majority of cases, you can't really make a case that it matters unless you're talking about like, like, what is the rationale for not allowing a woman in a train car like that? That I just. If if you believe as a Haredi individual, right, and that again, what? the law is is on your side. You are a hundred percent right but what, in this case. What is? But what? It, let's say you are a Haredi individual. What do you? They believe what that is they it, should, What do they think is going to happen if a woman's in the train? They rightfully or wrongfully believe that women. Uh, and men are distractions unto each other, and therefore... But what um, are they being distracted from when they're on the train? Their purity of their thoughts, um, their their connection to God, their their potential uh, uh, licentious thoughts away their from community? their wives. They are trying to move away from that. Again, I'm not, I'm not really yeah. trying to defend them, but I'm also trying to sort of ask myself, if they had a 
a, a, a neutral way of explaining and saying we don't have a problem with women we uh and women are just as <laughs> hold on just hold on though, but and they do, they, they they do. do. I, i'm not so stop. they <laughs> they do if, if if they went and said it is not about women it is equally okay. about men women should have just as many rights to not have men around them than women right if 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 you really went and said listen we just want total gender segregation but equality and we want separate cars for men and for women then okay. you know yes. maybe there should be Elephant some sort of accommodation Time, Avi, which is that what concerns me here is not just violence. It is girls grow up in these communities. Yes. Yes. Okay? I am and with I, you. I think the state of Israel has a duty to its girls, the including of the women. ones, including the ones who happen to be born into these communities. Here, and I here think is something that that's for a future a case column. where I was going to say that I think that that's where Israel's. If you really Duty. want to do a, a follow up to this, you should look up Chochmat Nashim. Chochmat Nashim is a wonderful organization that is in Israel, is actually internationally based, but they're they're very much focused in, uh, on a lot of stuff in Israel, where they point out the erasure of women and girls from popular media, where you have these images for like advertisements for Shabbat dinners, and all you see around the table are men, even though the people that are cooking and preparing these meals are women. So um, you get a lot of gay men being like, excellent. And yes, exactly. Up. So these these are this this organization is sitting there pointing out um, that women belong in these spaces. Women are not uh, objects of pure lust and that's the only thing that they are good for and that women are part of society and the erasure of women hurts men maybe too. the women in this, this community is, are just so extremely spectacularly good looking all of them and that it is more distracting than in the rest of society it's, I, I have no I, idea but i'm saying that i will i will I be the assume, first one to say that is not true i, I would say i would assume <laughs> without saying spectacularly good, spectacularly good looking people are equally distributed in all populations i'm yes. sure but the point is that um yeah, I don't know. This just so so that is a hundred percent. You yeah. are completely right on that on that regard because the erasure of women does hurt men and women. It especially hurts women. Especially hurts girls who don't see themselves in society. They don't see role models, and and it is a huge, huge, huge problem. I'm with you on it's every also step nonsense along the way. That only women would inspire lust. Like maybe some women are looking at these I, pictures I, of all these men at a table and being that like that are. one, that one over there with the the one with the beard. No, no, wait, no, the one that one with the beard i think he's, that he's the one <laughs> you are going to get all our haredi listeners very very mad at you why um, <laughs> uh, to, to say that there could be an attractive man with a beard are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question atelier lou has all this and more eric and the team at atelier lou can craft a piece for you or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer from a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. Should we speak? go from beards to noses? Oh, yes. Can we, can we, can we uh, segue from beards to noses? Because um, the other big story of the moment, the, the most um, well-endowed story well. <laughs> in the Shanaz department, <laughs> Leonard Bern... What? Leonard Bern, Bernstein? Bernstein? No. No, 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 Abby no, no, corrected no. me. Abby corrected <laughs> I, me. I, I once met Jamie Bernstein, Leonard's uh, daughter, who said it is Bernstein. It always has and it always will be. I said, doesn't it Bernstein sound more Jewish? Like it, it sounds like more waspy to say Bernstein. And she goes, no, think about it as if you're <laughs> speaking from the, the old country, Bernstein. I was like, I, I guess you're right. And so from, from this, <laughs> that day on, I say Leonard Bernstein, as I am told to say. Okay, well, well, we will. So the question of whether one should obey the wishes of Leonard Bernstein's children is so pertinent to our topic right now, because, so I have to do a little backstory. There's a new biopic of the great, late, the late, great um, American Jewish um, composer and conductor starring um, an actor named Bradley Cooper, who is a kind of, how, how would you describe him physically? Um, is he, is he sitting around the? I was gonna say, is he sitting around the table and the <laughs> images that don't include the Haredi women and only the Haredi men? No, no, he is a a Gentile gentleman. 
Um, and they come in all kinds, but he's of, of the more unambiguously Gentile sort, perhaps. Um, and for that reason, to be in this biopic, um, they made him up to look like the person he's playing and did so in part with the assistance of, it would seem, a little bit of flesh-colored um, material on the nose. You know, I, I saw this photo and he actually, he looks good with it. I think he looks more <laughs> like Leonard Bernstein. I think he's able to portray <laughs> this better. My initial thought was if other people had known that he was so good at like doffing, uh, doffing, no, a uh, donning a, a, a prosthetic nose, he probably should have played the Barbara Streisand role in A Star is Born. Definitely. Because why stop there? Um, yeah. Because no, he was I the mean, other, he was the other side, right? It was Lady Gaga and him. Right. Right. I mean, so I think, <laughs> no, that I see what you're saying. No, it, <laughs> Well, so that actually gets at another issue, which is that the fact that, like, there's this kind of notion that there's no such thing as looking Jewish. But there's also the fact that, like, as has been amply remarked upon, Jews and Italians play each other all the time in especially American movies and TV shows. There's kind of an interchangeable Jews and Italians category. And your favorite character, Babu Bhatt, um, was was Jewish and clearly was also... That yeah. too, but that's more the sort of Jews can look any which way sort of category into which one can also put Alicia Silverstone and always would um, in the 90s. But yeah, so basically the point is that there is such a thing as looking Jewish insofar as it's recognized in the world. It's a thing that people recognize. Therefore, it's a thing in the world. Doesn't mean that people who don't look that way aren't as Jewish. It just means that there's such a category in the world that people recognize, right? So that that's kind of what I'm getting at. But the point is, um, does that mean... So this is the thing that I found very strange is this idea that it's like inherently bad if but, you're Jewish to have... So that that I don't really buy. It, but then, if you're playing Clark Gable, are you not allowed to wear large ears? Because, no. you know, even though he's not Jewish, like I'm so, saying that like maybe yeah. somebody's specific feature, right? You know, you can't rely on something like this. Like I, I this is the part that bothers me is that everybody's basically pointing out, oh, Jews have big noses, Jews have big noses, Jews have big noses. It's just it's not true. It's some Jews have big noses, but some I Jews mean, have small I have noses. no idea who has which size noses. And my calipers are in the shop. Oh, yeah. But what I was going to say is um, that I think where I could see an issue and where I did at first was there was this screenshot going around um there was a side by side, although the angles were possibly different, and this was a key. This is got real detective work here of the real Leonard Bernstein and Bradley Cooper in this prosthetic nose, and people were claiming. Some people on the internet were claiming that this was a case not of uh, Bradley Cooper being made up to look like one specific Jew named Leonard Bernstein, but rather that this was a case of. Bradley Cooper being put in some sort of um, Jew face, as it were, that is being given a big nose to play some Jew who just so happened to be Leonard Bernstein. And that I could see as troubling. Like if somebody, if to indicate that the actor is playing a Jew, you pop on some kind of like, you know, joke shop glasses with nose attached, then <laughs> fine, like that's not great. But um, if, somebody's playing somebody else specific. So that's where it gets a little interesting. And this is not the first time this has come up and where, what I thought of in terms of um, a similar case was um, when the actress Zoe Saldana was cast to play Nina Simone in a biopic. Both of these women are slash were uh, people of color, black women. However, Zoe Saldana is not, nearly as dark skinned as um, Nina Simone was. And I remember there being discussion of like, was she put in makeup or something to make her look darker? And is this bad because it's taking, you know, presumably for a couple reasons. One is like, is it blackface if the woman herself is black, but just in darker makeup, but also like, like could a darker skinned woman have been cast? Avi, are you mad about um, Bradley Cooper's giant sort of room filling Leonard Bernstein nose in this um, movie? I am so so blasé about this whole thing. I, uh, like, it means nothing to me. I think that Jews can play non-Jews. I think non-Jews can play Jews. I think you should put on a prosthetic nose. I think you should digitally de-age yourself. You if think that's I what should works. personally put on a prosthetic Whoever nose? Whoever wants to. If you want to walk down the street, right, if you want to be the, um, if you are not Jewish, no, you are Jewish, Phoebe. I'm not arguing I you. Think so. If one was not Jewish and wants to be the Jewish Rachel Dolezal and put on a prosthetic nose, <laughs> <laughs> 
and a, and a wig and go to and go to Israel and be kicked off of buses. Do we think somebody's doing this in this world? I am sure. I am sure it there is a are wide people. world because there was there was definitely there was the gay fake Orthodox Jew yep. who had the yep. Instagram. So maybe somewhere there's the. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I do like I've been I think for this years is part obsessed of acting. with this, this idea is part of, of theater. This is part of makeup. Yeah, it, to of me, the it's, looking Jewish as being like an inherently bad thing. And like, what if the larger noses are nicer? Hmm? Like, maybe yeah, that's also yeah, a possibility. Perhaps, perhaps maybe he's a, just maybe he's going to keep the nose in everyday life. There's a graphic novel memoir that I remember seeing about a Iranian American woman, and it was called "How Come the Boys Get to Keep Their Noses." <laughs> um, and I didn't read it. Iranian Jewish. I I've believe. seen, I've yes, seen plenty of boys who didn't keep their noses. But anyway, yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. I'm sure, but I'm sure on the whole that is true. Um, yeah, I have so little. Like, what? What is the thing that you say nowadays? No fucks given. Like, I, I just it doesn't matter. Okay, to me. so this gets like, okay. There's just one. I have one final point on this, which is that I think that I, my hunch before we is put that a button nose where, on it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, my hunch is that this is how most people feel, most Jews, and just most people generally. But what happens, and this still happens even years into this phenomenon is like something makes the rounds online people post about it people write think tank think pieces oh, think tank pieces about it think tank pieces whatever i don't know i wrote about it but i wrote about it just because i thought it was kind of funny just, but the point is something seems like oh people are talking about jews are mad about it. it's like no is anybody actually nobody's surveying anybody that like, probably not people are probably not actually all that mad about this i happen to know um, some yeah. jewish people that are mad about it but but I have so little stock in what some of these people say. Like they're like I don't know. Are these people who are mad about everything? Is it possible? Yes, exactly. Okay. I think that there, and there are people. Are, every who, group has people who are mad about everything. Yes, yeah. and and so those people you get discount. You you lose your right. Just like uh, in in Haredi society, you lose your right <laughs> to be treated seriously because you get violent and angry at people instead of being nice. Right. You you the fact that you are always incredulous and angry about everything in your day-to-day life um, against the Jews, right, um, makes me lose credit, like a lot of respect for you and you lose a lot of credibility as an individual when you get angry about stuff like this because you're getting angry about everything. Mm-hmm. So maybe the answer is to be less angry about uh, some makeup in a movie and I'm going to say more angry about um violence yes how's yes, it trite 100%. but true perhaps yes let's let's put a button nose on that one yes. and uh, be done with it let's hear from our sponsor and after that let's hear our nachos of the week beth david hebrew school is now accepting new students one of toronto's most dynamic egalitarian conservative congregations is offering personalized hebrew lessons hands-on learning exciting field trips and small group activities all with a hot dinner included. This is Jewish exploration that will last your children a lifetime. Classes run weekly on Monday nights from 5 to 7.15 p.m. starting September 18th. To learn more and enroll, visit BethDavid.com or email Adina, that's A-D-I-N-A, at BethDavid.com. Phoebe, what's your nachos this week? Well, Avi, my nachos this week is going to have to be, um, speaking of creatures with long noses, um, visiting the (laughs) llamas in High Park Mm. Zoo. This is in Toronto. So if you're not in Toronto, my sincerest apologies. And I would warn against making a special trip to Toronto to do it because so we moved to the area not so, so far from this park or this zoo um, in June 2020. For years, there's been discussion of will the llama pen activities reopen? And then they said, yes, the llama pen will activities have reopened. And every weekend without fail on their Instagram, it would say the zoo was open, but llama pen activities are closed every weekend. So this was going on for like months, weeks, I don't know, for quite a while. But then finally, um, last weekend, llama pen activities I mean, they never actually announced this. I just like happened to be jogging by there and kind of could tell that it seemed like it would be. Um, llama pen activities reopened and I went with my family and Wait, does we... the llama pen have a llama gate? Because then <laughs> this is the name of this scandal. <laughs> it should. <laughs> um, but there, you can feed them. Basically, you the, the zoo is free to enter, but you, you pay um, $2 like as a donation to the zoo and you can feed the llamas and it's incredible. Um, I have no idea what the llama food is. Is it kosher? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what's in it. Um, and, but whatever, they seem the llamas seem to enjoy it. And you put your hand out or your child realistically puts uh, 
their hand out and the llamas eat the food and it is just the cutest thing and you can pet them on the back of their necks and on their back apparently they don't like to be petted on their heads I, who knew but um they are so soft and um this was really really delightful and i might have to do this every weekend now because it's not that far from where i live and um so if you want to tell me why i was wrong about everything on the podcast you'll find me at the llama pen <laughs> um yeah so um, that's my knock us I, is pet I do llamas believe, if you live near them I, I do believe for our non-toronto listeners they need to know that um if all they hear about toronto is from the years of uh, from the mouth of phoebe maltz bovey only thing that happens in toronto is eating pastries and going to the zoo and 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 you should know that there's not that much more to do in Toronto, but there this is, is more to do in Toronto than eating pastries and bagels and going to the zoo. Um, maybe we what? should be feeding them Montreal bagels, uh, mm. the llamas. That that might actually. Um, I think you be would be kicked a, out of the zoo for that. <laughs> perhaps I don't know. I want to hear about your nachas, Avi. Is it not about pastries or <laughs> neither zoo animals? Oh. Neither. Okay, I'll bear with you. I would like to talk to you about uh, Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick for my nachas this week. They were a Tony Award winning songwriting duo who were the brains behind musicals such as Fiorello, The Rothschilds, The Apple Tree, and of course, Fiddler on the Roof. Now, what I'm about to play you is not new, but it was new to me when I stumbled across it this week, much to my delight, and I hope Phoebe to yours as well. So this is a clip from a program Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick did back in 1964, mere weeks after the premiere of Fiddler, and in it, they explained the genesis of the opening number and how it started as a completely different song. Our original opening number for the show that was about the Sabbath for the mother and the five daughters who were trying to get the house cleaned up and get everything done before the sun went down, because at sunset the Sabbath began. So this is the outtake of the opening number, and I, I don't know, I actually think it's so much better. Um, I would like you to help me judge for, it, am I wrong? Or is it just the novelty of this being so much fun? One of the uh, daughters sings... Mama, mama, you mustn't get so nervous. Mama, mama, for heaven's sakes, relax. Relax. So who can relax while there's so much to be done? Keeping one eye on the soup and the other on the sun. Mama, mama, don't be nervous. Mama will be ready long before the sun has set. We've never missed a Sabbath yet. Somehow the house will be clean. Floors will be swept. Soup will be cooked. Fish will be sliced. Somehow. There's noodles to make and chicken to be plucked and liver to be chopped and challah to be baked. Race with the sun so at the proper time the candles can be lit and blessed. What do you think? Are you doubled over in laughter on the floor? Um, no, I, I mean, I was laughing a bit, but I was also partly laughing because I was thinking about how, um, how plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Exactly. I have to vacuum. Um, so even whether or not you observe the Sabbath, that this idea of it being in a panic to finish it all in time, if, for example, your child's school ends at a particular time, you have to get to pick up. It, it's all, it's very relatable is all I'm going to say. I have not plucked any chickens today and this is making me anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what's going on with the Haredi society is that they haven't plucked chickens lately. And that's that's a problem. They uh, could just de-stress a mindful, mindful chicken plucking. Uh, the, the only other thing I can say is you should go see the video of this. It's great. It's, I think it I was will. recorded. That great. Yeah. It was recorded in 1964, several weeks after the opening of it. So most of the people in the audience probably haven't even seen the uh, play itself. Um, I, I believe that if they were to recreate this film in 2023, they might need some prosthetic noses. On that note, great show as always. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Avi. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending August 26th, Shabbat Parashat Ki Tetzay. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcast is Michael Freeman. Our music is by SoCalled. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We would love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. And as always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. 
I'm Avi Feingold. And I'm Phoebe maltz Thanks for joining. There's noodles to make and chicken to be plucked and liver to be chopped and thawed to be baked. Race with the sun so at the proper time the candles can be lit and blessed, etc. Jewish comedy legend Modi and Hasidic rapper Nisim Black are coming to Toronto to perform live at UJA's campaign launch on September 7th. Visit jewishtoronto.com to get your tickets today. Don't miss Modi and Nisim Black on September 7th. Go to jewishtoronto.com for your ticket today.